Hello everybody, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our latest Facebook Live session. My name is Ellie and I run social media for Find My Past. Uh, I hope you're all keeping well. I'm broadcasting here from my lovely home office. Uh, okay, it's my lounge. Um, <laughs> say hello to me in the comments if you can hear and see me okay, just so I know that you're all there. Um, and we'll get cracking in a moment once I can tell that we've got a couple of people watching. Um, so yeah, you may have seen that we've been running some extra special community content um, on our Facebook page. It's live, it's free, um, and it's all in addition to what Alex already does with Facebook Live on a Friday. Um, and you may have also seen our CEO's video message from the other day as well. Um, the idea is just to bring everybody together during these uncertain times um, to distract us in a good way. And it means that we can come together over our shared love of history and of the past. So yeah, that's why we're doing these. Um, so I appreciate you joining us. I can see William's already here. So hello, William, nice to see you. Yeah, if you can hear me, if you can see me, okay, just drop me a quick comment, say hello. Um, we'll get cracking shortly with what we're going to be chatting about today. I don't know about you guys, but it is a beautiful day here in Scotland today. It's so sunny. The sun has been coming into my lounge from the windows. It's been so toasty. Um, I've been rather enjoying actually it's just, just sitting at my desk, cracking on with some work in the sun. I feel like a cat just sort of snoozing away. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Thanks for, so much for joining us today. Brilliant. Right. Um, so I just wanted to say as well, I know our recent email said that today's session was going to be on US records. Unfortunately, we have had to postpone this, but do keep an eye out for when our next session on US records is going to be. And I hope I'm a decent replacement for that. Last week, I put a quick call out on Facebook for questions on the 1939 register. Um, the 1939 register is an incredible document. I'll tell you a little bit about my success with it um, in a few moments. Um, and I'm privileged to say that we've got loads of questions in. So thank you so much to everybody who's submitted. And we have our very own in-house expert, Steve Rigdon, who has kindly spent some time answering these questions for you. So I'm going to be reading those out. Um, while Steve isn't available to go live, he is on this chat as well. Um, he's watching the live stream. Um, so if you do have any other questions, pop them into the comments and he'll try his best to answer them. We've also got Alex as well. Uh, so Alex is with us in the comments, so do say hi to him too. Um, yeah, maybe if we've got a little bit of time at the end, we'll do some some live questions um, just in case there's anything Alex or Steve hasn't got round to answering. Let's have a look and see who else has joined us. William says it was sunny and now it's blue sky and cloudy. Well, it's always better than the rain, I find. <laughs> uh, we've got John as well. Hi, John. We've got Anne. Hello. Um, yeah, we've got Alex as well saying he's tuning in for the comments. Um, so. Yeah, I think we'll uh, we'll get started. Um, just to preface this, this session on the 1939 register is is designed for beginners, um, but you might learn something that you don't already know. And I thought it would be good to chat briefly about the context behind the 1939 register. Um, and Steve has kindly provided me with some information as well. So uh, we'll get started with that first, and then what we'll do is we'll turn to the questions, um, and hopefully it'll be really informative for you all. So first of all, the 1939 register. Uh, at the outbreak of the Second World War, the government needed up-to-date information on the civil population of England and Wales. And to gather this, they took a national register on the 29th of September, 1939. And they took personal details down, such as their names, dates of birth, addresses, occupations, and this was of around 41 million people. So it was an absolutely staggering project, <laughs> as I'm sure you can appreciate. And what this allowed the government to do was to issue identity cards, start rationing, um, start, start the health service, um, post war credits and also family allowances. So just a little bit of background there for you. Um, and you might be thinking that's all and well and good, but what 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 good is that to me? How is that going to help me in my family history? 
And I thought I'd just share with you a little success story that I've had with it. So I found out after doing a DNA test that I was around 6% Scottish. And I never knew this. Uh, I'd even quizzed um, my remaining family members. Do you know if we've got Scottish ancestry? And no, nobody knew anything. So I thought it'd be a good idea to go to the records and see if I could confirm it. And well, I started out with my, my maternal line and I thought I'd do a little bit about my Smiths. So my great grandmother was a Smith and she was born in the Midlands in, I think something like 1913, I think. And while I was digging around census records, I found that her grandfather, who I thought was her grandfather, was born in Scotland. And I thought, oh, maybe that's a line I can follow. So in all the cross-referencing and the checking and the ordering of certificates, um, I found out that that particular family who I thought were my family were from Dumfries. But the final clue in the puzzle for me was finding my great great grandparents living in North Wales in the 1939 register and they were living in a cottage called wait for it Dumfries <laughs> I couldn't believe it the the everything just fell into place with that little clue and next door there was I believe a great uncle a great great uncle of mine and living in a cottage called Lockerbie and I just thought that's it, I proved it. I'm part Scottish and I now live in Scotland. So I thought that was a, a nice little revelation for me and also for my family. Um, my mum and my grandma, when I told them, they had absolutely no idea that that's why the cottages were named Dumfries and Lockerbie. So that was, uh, it was a nice surprise and I enjoyed that. Let's, before we move on, let's have another quick look at the comments. We've got Kathleen, we've got Ricky, hello, we've got Paul, Denise, Trish, Angela, Sandy, Sylvia, Ian. Goodness, there's a lot of you watching. No pressure. <laughs> it's lovely to see you all. I hope you're all keeping really well in these times as well and keeping busy. Pat, Cindy, Anya, Five Family History Society, always a pleasure to have you join us. I know you join us uh, for Friday's Live with Alex as well. So let's move on. Um, so some of the other information Steve kindly provided me with was that for a genealogist, uh, the 1939 register should be regarded similar to a census because it was for the civil population. And its value is just gonna increase over time, um, mainly because it's gonna serve as a, a bridge between living memory and the publicly available censuses. So the most recent census we've got is the 1911 census and then the 1921 census should be published in 2022. However, after that, as I'm sure some of you are already aware, there are going to be no more censuses, <laughs> not until the 1951 census, which won't be published until 2052. And Steve just wanted you all to know at this point, he probably will have hung up his family historian boots, as I'm sure many of us will have done by that point. <laughs> um, what's handy about the 1939 register as well is that it gives you something that no other census can give you. Um, it can give you a date of birth of your ancestor. And that's been great for me because it means I don't have to order lots of certificates <laughs> from the GRO. So that's been quite useful on my part. Another unique little feature is that although it was a snapshot in time, as most censuses are, it immediately became a working document and it was updated and annotated over time with the last changes made to it in 1991. So this is why you might find when you're looking at the original images that there have been notes and annotations and other handwriting and other ink as well. Um, errors in the originals were corrected. If somebody changed their name, that was corrected as well. And for all of these annotations, you could see you can see an annotation in the same pen. This usually gives a date and a code which can refer to a district or the type of change being noted as well. Um, and it can also be really good for finding out who your ancestor married, especially if you, she was a she was a woman, um, because the, her married name will have been added in by the NHS later on. And above all, it, it gives us a real, a real insight into family life and what our families were up to uh, just as the Second World War broke out. Um, so it really is a fascinating document. If you've not looked at it yet, I really would uh, advise uh, checking it out. 
so brilliant let's move on let's just have another quick look in the comments and see what you're all chatting about in here hello karen someone born in dumfries fantastic <laughs> hello sonia from Bury st edmunds hi patricia lovely ian you're in north wales i'm from north wales myself yes that's a, i think i've already mentioned <laughs> um I did want to say as well that um, Steve had actually kindly provided me with an activity so you can create your own identity card from the 1939 register. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into this now, but what I'll do is I'll pop it in the Find My Pass forum and I'll put it on the Facebook page later on once we've finished up here. Um, and maybe you can create your own identity card just for a little bit of fun. So now what we'll do is we'll move on to the questions that Steve has answered from the pre-submitted questions. But as I said, if you do have any others, pop them in the comments and hopefully Alex and Steve will be able to help you with those. And we'll see if we can squeeze some in at the end as well. So the first question I've got here is from Richard and Richard asked, why is the 1939 register public, but the 1921 census isn't? And Steve has provided with me with a, a very good response. <laughs> and he says, um, the answer is a legal one. So the 1921 census and all later censuses are governed by Act of Parliament. The 1920 Census Act effectively guarantees closure for 100 years. However, the 1939 register was not organised and undertaken under the 1920 Census Act, but under an emergency measure called the National Registration Act of 1939. And this was repealed in 1952. And although the background is complex, the question of whether the 1939 register should be closed or opened went before the Information Commissioner's Office. And ultimately the decision was made that the information could be released from the 1939 register and this then led to the publication of it in 2015. So that's your question answered. I hope that helps you Richard. So Carol would like to know, um, she says that she's trying to find out where family members, her mother, her grandmother and her sister were in 1939 and she says this is difficult because they were Scottish. Um, and she also says to trace each person would cost £15 each and even then you only get a tight certificate. And she says, why is the 1939 Scottish registry not available to view as it is in England and Wales? So Steve's response to this is that the 1939 national registration took place right across the UK, but parts of the register have been devolved and are held by different governmental institutions. The 1939 register that we've got on Find My Past is the one for England and Wales and is held by, the, by NHS England and has been digitally accessioned, I'm hoping I'm, hoping I'm pronouncing that right, <laughs> by the National Archives. Scotland, of course, like Northern Ireland, is its own jurisdiction with its own legal system and National Records of Scotland hold the corresponding Scottish 1939 register. Don't touch your face, don't touch your face. I'm not touching my face, okay? <laughs> you can apply for an extract and pay the fee if you wish to using the NR1 form on the NRS's website. So I hope that helps. Uh, Joanne has asked a question about abbreviations because if you look at the original documents for the 1939 register, there are abbreviations all over the place. Um, so Steve has helpfully done a quick guide to abbreviations, which I will read out here. Um, but if anybody does want me to post them on our Facebook page, let me know and I'll do that later on as well, in addition to the, the activity for the ide identity cards. Um, so Steve says that the local government administrative, excuse me, administrative areas used for taking the 1939 national registration were borough and district. So you'll often see the following abbreviations after the borough or district name. So RD stands for rural district, UD for urban district, MB for excuse me, municipal borough, and CB for county borough. Uh, you'll often find as well, um, if you're looking at a hospital, for example, um, some, stop touching your face, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you'll often see if somebody uh, was living in a hospital or similar, um, the institutions, everybody would have another letter next to them in column five. So an officer would have O, V for visitor, S for servant, P for patient, and I for inmate. Um, 
and then obviously we've got marital status as well so d for divorced m for married s for single and w for widowed and Steve also wanted to mention about column 11 as well, uh, which is the C instructions column. And you often find additional information about a person in this column. Um, one particular use was for civil defence roles. So you might find AFS for auxiliary fire service. You might find ARP for air raid precautions, VAD for voluntary aid detachment and WVS for women's voluntary service. But Steve does say if there are any other abbreviations you've come across and you'd like to know more about, um, just let us know and he's happy to help. Aren't you, Steve? <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this. Let's have another quick look at the comments and see what you're all chatting about, shall we? Andrea Pernandar from Rex and Pernandar, Andrea. <laughs> My Welsh is uh, limited to say the least. Um, maybe that's why I was expelled to Scotland. I wasn't expelled, I'm, I'm, li I'm lying entirely. Um, who else have we got here? Sandy from Itchwit, Ipswich. Hello. <laughs> um, who else have we got? We've got Julie, lovely. Anna would love it if the Scottish one was released. Yeah, if, if you drop the NRS a quick email, they might be able to give you a little bit more information on that. Fantastic. Okay, I think we're up to date on the comments there. So we'll go in we'll going to the next couple of questions. Um, so Sheila asks, why does my grandmother's married name show up when she didn't marry until after the war? Now, you, I mentioned earlier that the NHS updated the register with changes of name, etc. And this is the answer to that question. Um, so because the censuses we know traditionally from 1841 to 1911 were snapshots in time, um, the 1939 register was a working document and it was updated. Um, so the NHS, which was founded in 1948, uh, took over the 1939 register as its central register. So most of the annotations that you see on the pages were actually made by NHS staff. Isn't that lovely? Um, and if you've ever wondered why the right hand pages in each image seem to cut off after column 11, that's because the rest of the right hand page was the postings column. And this was used by the NHS to record patient information in coded form. And due to the sensitivity of this information, it's been permanently redacted and that will never become public information. So the NHS, they needed to be able to track people through their lives using this central register. And this included if a woman got married. So if she did get married or if a person changed their name, sorry, <laughs> that's a terrible habit. Um, the NHS would then record in a different, different handwriting, obviously, and a different pen, different colour ink. They'd cross out the, the maiden name and they'd add in the married name. And they'd usually add in roughly when that note was taken as well. Um, and what is quite handy is that both names on Find My Pass are searchable. So the maiden name and the married name. Um, it's it's really quite useful because it means that you don't then have to go looking for a marriage certificate for this person either. Um, you can just pop the information into a marriage search um, on our website and uh, you should find the name of the person that she married. Fantastic. Let's have a, a move on. Uh, Gary says that he can't find his grandparents at the moment. And Steve says that there could be several different reasons for this. So one possibility is that his that your grandparents were born within the most recent 100 years and either still alive or we don't have evidence of their death yet so their records are still closed um and the closed records in case i wasn't clear before they are the redacted black lines on the original images and it's important to note as well that closed records are not searchable so when you search for a name a closed record will not appear in your search results um so that's just uh, sort of something to remember um, Steve goes on to say that if your grandfather was in the armed forces in September of 1939, was a merchant marine or a fisherman at sea, he may not appear. He also says that some streets or sections of streets are actually missing. And if so, they may have gone astray over the period of time when the 1939 register was in use as the NHS central register. Uh, as it was a working document by the NHS for over 50 years, it's no wonder some parts of it have become torn. You might see sticky tape. Um, you might see where they've tried to repair bits of the paper. Um, it's, po it's possible pages have been lost, sadly. Um, they've fallen out. They've been reinserted. 
Um, what you might see as well on some of the originals, um, that they're actually photocopies. Um, so when a page became too damaged, um, the NHS would photocopy it, destroy the originals, and then put the photocopies back into the original books. Um, and around 8% of the surviving 1939 register is, is in the form of photocopies. Um, another reason why you might not be able to find a specific person is simply human error. This includes clerical error back in 1939 and also inscription errors as well when we digitised it. Uh, we do have a reporting feature. If you do come across a, a transcription error, you can send that through to us and we'll, we'll change the transcription error for you. Um, and sometimes you can try and work around this by changing your search terms and not relying so much on the forename and the surname. You can search without names at all because um, you might not know but all of our search fields are completely optional which is handy so you can add in a, a date of birth and a district perhaps and just see what comes up that way so colleen says my ancestors are the only house in their street not on the register will that alter um, and steve does preface his answer with this by just saying without knowing the specifics of the street in question it's hard to give an answer but he he has a like he always has tries, tried his best with this. Um, so what he says is, um, the street is often divided up in the 1939 register, a specific street, uh, just as it is in censuses. This is because the enumerators conducting the national registration were set small districts of their own. So each of which it was believed could be comfortably covered by one person within one single day, just to make sure they, uh, they weren't overloaded with too much work, of course. So one enumerator might be assigned one side of the street and a different enumerator might be assigned the other side of the street. Um, and where that happens, the different parts of the street will actually be found in different books. So you might have to go and have a look in a different book to find the other half of the street. Um, what you might notice as well, um, addresses on the 1939 register are not as we would know them today. So house name, street name, town, county, postcode and trying to remember all the components of an address today in the 1939 register they were recorded by street county and district um so it's why it's sometimes a little bit tricky if you're searching for like a small village in you know rural wales that's why it's a little bit tricky because the name of the village actually wasn't recorded <laughs> but we do try our best don't we um, steve also says typically where odd and even houses are on opposite sides of the street it's as is often the case, uh, the odd numbered houses will be in one book and the even numbered houses will be in another. So even when an enumerator was assigned the entire street, he or she would have walked around their patch in a way of their choosing. Um, they might have turned down a side street, they might have gone over the bridge. <laughs> this could go on and on for a while, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, so this is called the enumerator's walk, just as it was in censuses. And where that happened, different parts of a street would appear on different pages of the same booklet. And of course, it is important to know that not all properties were occupied on the 29th of September 1939. Vacant properties were sometimes shown, some they should technically have been marked with a V on the original image, but likely some enumerators um, just didn't do that, which is a shame for us because it's nice to know when um, you know a particular property wasn't, uh, wasn't occupied at the time. Um, but of course, some will have slipped through the cracks. Uh, Steve finishes by saying that if you are searching for a house that does appear to be missing, for example, if you're looking them for number 28 and you can see that the image house has the even numbers 22, 24, 26, 30, 32, but no 28, it would seem that 28 was unoccupied on that date. So 29th of September 1939. Great. I'm going to have another flip through into the comments quickly before we carry on with the last couple of questions, uh, just to see what you're all chatting about. And you're all just helping each other again. Oh, I, lo I love it when you do this. This is what I love about my job. I get to see you all helping each other out. And it really does. Uh, it really warms my heart, especially, uh, especially times like this. Um, we've got Elsa. Hi. Nice to see you. We've got William helping people out. Lovely. Andrea, my mother-in-law was one of twins, but only her sister was mentioned on the register. That's interesting. Alex or Steve, if you can uh, if you can answer Andrea's comment, that would be lovely, actually. Maybe if we could get sp some specifics, Andrea, if you're still listening. Um, maybe we can maybe we can find the other twin. Interesting. 
I love, I love, uh, I love things like this. <laughs> okay, let's have a flip through back to the questions. So we've got Pauline here says that she has an uncle on the 1939 voting register. So I looked him up on the 1939 register only to find that half the street is missing. Uh, if I remember right, without checking, the register does the street number, excuse me, I'm just trying to read this, eight and he lived at 15. So it only goes up to eight and he lived at 15. Why would it have half a street? And he said he was living at 14 First Square Stainforth in West Yorkshire. My apologies if I've mispronounced that. Um, so number 15 seems to be missing. No, 14 is missing, my apologies interesting okay so yeah steve says to that um it does appear that it's missing from the original booklet um but because you've been able to give some specifics there steve's actually gone and reported that for you um so if we do have it we will certainly get that added onto, onto the site so do keep checking back again if you if you come across if anybody comes across instances where a page seems to be missing please give all the details drop them in an email to support we'll get it reported and if we can we'll try our very best to make sure that that page is included on summer past uh, next question so janet i've been trying to find two siblings of my mother both of them died around 1941-42 one in a hospital and one was killed missing in action overseas okay and she also goes on to say two further siblings have died more recently. One of these was overseas. At the home address, there is one more closed entry than I thought there would be. Am I think, right in thinking that this is one of the two I'm looking for, but where was the other one? Excuse me, stay hydrated. Okay, so Steve says, we understand that your mother then had four siblings. The first thing to say is that entries are closed by default they can only be opened if we have the evidence of death this does mean that some records of deceased people will remain closed because we don't have the evidence to open their record and we can't open the record without that proof it's just to protect the data and the identity of the person below the redacted line <clears throat> excuse me um so steve suggests one of four things might have happened here the sibling who went missing in action would presumably have been in the armed forces by the 29th of September 1939 and therefore won't appear on the register because the register was for the civilian population only. The sibling who died overseas um, is probably a closed record. Um, we are unlikely to have received evidence of death because they passed away overseas. Um, so we'd need a certificate sending in um, in order to open up the record. He goes on to say that the other sibling who died recently may also be missing from the search results if we've got no evidence of death for them and um, they would still <clears throat> excuse me this is what happens when i talk too much i start to lose my voice um they would still show us clothes and be redacted um until we receive um, proof of death uh, lastly he says that the sibling who died in hospital during wartime should be an open record however it's not possible um excuse me it's it's possible that all, not all wartime civilian casualties were recorded or annotated in the 1939 register. And it, it might mean that that record is still closed. But if you do find it, if you, and you could send in a certificate for us, we'll open up the record for you. That's not a problem. We've got a, a system in place that allows you to do that. Um, if you find your transcription, click on the person in question and click the open this record button. And there's a short form for you to fill out and then you can upload your death certificate there as well. So next question, uh, we've got Lee on the 1939 registers at a certain address and you have a family member living there, but there's another person blacked out at the same address. So in order for you to have it unlocked, you'd need to prove that they've passed away. So how do you know whose death certificate to provide if you don't know who it is that's blacked out? I had this issue with a family member who had died and was on the register, but I didn't know anything about him. That is a little bit of a conundrum, Lee. I will, I will grant you that. Um, and Steve agrees. Um, unfortunately, we can only open a record when we've got evidence of death. And in order for us to have that, we we need to we need to know who it is. Um, it's not possible to be sure which individual lies beneath that redaction line. 
Um, but that's the point of the redaction, unfortunately, um, to protect the, the details of the person there because they may still be alive. Um, and there's sensitive information such as dates of birth as well. We've, we've got to take all of that into consideration. However, Steve does want to point out that you can sometimes make an educated guess as to who the closed record is. Um, you would know that, for example, the person would have been born in the last 100 years. Um, and also the way the households were laid out, they would usually have the head of the family first um, and then any children in age order. And then anybody else after that would be, you know, a lodger or a boarder or older family members as well. So just take that into consideration. Um, Steve also wanted me to let you know that um, <laughs> he wanted to know if he knew the difference between a boarder and a lodger. And I didn't. So I've learned something new today. <laughs> um, he says that a lodger sleeps in the house but takes his meals elsewhere and a boarder sleeps and eats in the house. Just in case you didn't know because I didn't. So thank you, Steve, for that. He'd stick, by the way, Steve, you've been absolutely wonderful in answering all these questions in so much detail. Um, I appreciate it, and I'm sure the rest of the community appreciates it so, as well. So thank you. <laughs> uh, right, I think we've got two questions left, I think. So let's have a look at those, because we are, we are at half four, but I do want to finish these. I hope that's all right with everybody. So Emily says, I can't seem to find one of my relatives on the register are there any other avenues I can use to find him? He might have been living on the streets or in a boy's home and he was 10 years old at this time. So Steve says that if he was born in around 1929, uh, the reason he might not appear is because his record is likely still closed because he would be under 100 years old at this time. Um, but on another note, some people were missed when the register was first taken. The authorities were aware of this and um, they knew, for example, that merchant seamen and fishermen might be away and that there were arrangements made later to register them when they came back into port. But we don't know if these special additional registers have actually survived um, and they were not part of our digitization project uh, back in 2015. So they have not been published. So that's something to be aware of. Um, but Steve goes on to say that it's possible similar arrangements were made for other people who were in the country but were missed for other reasons accidentally or who deliberately avoided being registered. So it's possible that a small boy living on the streets may have been missed and had to be picked up later on in the special registers. Um, this way he would have been given an NHS number and his ration book, etc. And if he was in a boy's home, um, it's more likely he would have been registered when the actual register was taken and his record is simply still closed. Um, so if you can maybe work out a, pot a potential boy's home where he may have been, um, you might be able to just submit a speculative death certificate that way and we'll see if he was in that boy's home at the time and hopefully get his record opened up. So last question then, we've got Rob, and this was from Twitter. All of the others were kindly submitted from Facebook. We, have, we did have one from Twitter. So, so thank you, Rob, for submitting this one. Um, and also I appreciate that, um, I hope you're watching as well. If you're usually on Twitter, not normally on Facebook, uh, I hope you're watching. So Rob says, how do you unlock the record of a relative who is deceased, but by date of birth is under 100 due to a quirk of family history? and you do not know what exact address they were living at during the time when the 1939 register was taken. And he says also this is his paternal grandmother. So Steve's, Steve says to this that this is actually quite common. Most family historians would not necessarily know where a member of their family were living at an exact point in time. So in this, in this instance, the 29th of September 1939. However, most people can get around this, especially if that person was living with somebody else. Um, what I quite like to do is if I can't find one particular person, um, especially if they might be closed, I'll go and look at who they may have been living with. So parents, grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, and so on and so forth. Um, the problem with an ancestor who is living away from a family in this instance, um, it could be a young woman in domestic service or a child who has been evacuated. 
I, I appreciate it's a problem and, and so does Steve in his response. Uh, unfortunately, we don't currently run a service where we search the closed database um, for people, I'm afraid. Um, but do keep looking. We are opening more records all the time from the 1939 register um, as more people pass that 100 year mark. Uh, right, I just want to have a quick look at, we've got a couple of questions that have been answered in here by Steve and just Steve, yeah, fine, brilliant. So we've got Angela says, why are some of the censuses blacked out? Uh, we've already answered this as well. Persons known to be alive or not known to have died, um, they will be redacted just to protect their information. We've got Jeffrey. Um, who says, I found numerous baptisms on family search, but I cannot find anything with respect to the census for 1831, 41, 51. And Steve says to this, leaks should be available in both 1841 and 1851. And um, the 1831 census doesn't survive um, except for just a few fragments. Um, he's had a quick look, Steve has, and we've got around 20,000 records for leak for those years, between 20 and about 23,000 for, for each of the census years. So it might be worth having another look at Jeffrey, just using a couple of wild cards as well. Um, see if you can find um, your relatives that way. Um, oh yes, fantastic. Steve has answered the question about uh, Andrea's twin, not Andrea's twin, the twins Andrew was looking for. Um, so Steve said they should both be on the register in normal circumstances. If your mother-in-law is still alive and her, her record should be redacted. If she is deceased now though, um, it should be possible to find her. Could she have been at a different address to her twin on this particular date? Um, fantastic, okay. Um, Pauline says, oh no, that one hasn't been answered yet. My apologies. Um, Kerry says, can you please let me know what at home by cleaners means? This was for a child in 1939. Steve says he would need to see the original image to understand the context. Um, it could be a mistranscription or a misreading of the original. Um, maybe drop support a quick line, Kerry, with a link to the record. Um, they can have a look and if they don't know, they can then ask Steve and uh, they, can, they can get back to you as well. Okay, so I think we've come to the end there. Um, thank you so much, Steve and Alex, for doing your best with the questions in, in the comments. Um, thank you all for joining me today. Um, this is my first time um, coming on video chat with all of you. Um, so thank you for making it less nerve wracking than I was hoping it would be. Um, Alex is usually the pro in this area because of course he does it every single Friday. Um, so I hope that I'll get to do another one of these again. Um, thank you for joining us. And remember also, you know, try and stay as upbeat as you can at these times. Stay safe, stay connected, um, talk to us. We've got the Find My Pass forum. You can come and join, join in the conversation on there as well. And keep an eye out for news of our next talks as well. So obviously Alex will be speaking tomorrow in his usual um, Fridays Live. Um, I can't remember whether you said you were going to do it at four or five o'clock, Alex. We'll confirm it tomorrow anyway. Um, and then for next week, we've got a great timetable coming your way. So just keep an eye out for announcements uh, closer to the time. Um, let's just uh, do a quick goodbye to everybody in the comments. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Elsa. Fantastic. No, thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rosie. Ricky, not even allowed out for sport in Naples. Oh, I'm really sorry. This is a really tricky time, but you know what? We're all coming together. We're all staying connected. We're all still talking to each other. Um, I think we just need to keep that going and try and stay as positive as we can in these extraordinary times, I think. Um, Anya, thanks, Ellie. That was great. We'll see you doing another one on Welsh ancestors. Maybe? <laughs> We'll go with maybe. <laughs> um, fantastic. So we'll round it off there. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Have a lovely evening. If you've got any other questions, just keep them coming in and um, maybe see you next time. <laughs>